Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome everyone to the webinar on energy efficiency in humanitarian organization infrastructure. My name is Rancha Basnet, and today I'll be a moderator for this webinar. This webinar is organized by the GIZ Energy X Solutions for Displacement Setting Program in collaboration with the UNHCR Greening and Sustainability Team and TTA Tramba Techno Ambiental. So welcome everyone to the webinar. Before we go and kickstart the webinar for today, uh, I would like to um, set out some few housekeeping rules. So today we are taking in your questions, so please do send us your question via the chat box that you see on your screen. In case you are logged in via computer, you will see a box that says questions on the right side of your screen. So there you can send us all your questions and we will then address to our speakers during the Q&A round. We do have set aside quite some time for Q&A, so I do encourage you to send us all your questions. And in case today you are logging in using a mobile device or a tablet, you will have the um, uh, GoToWebinar app. On that app, there is a Q, um, like a question mark icon. If you click on that, then a, a pop-up will appear like a chat box. And there you can type in your questions and send to us. So uh, please do send us your questions. You can send us throughout the whole webinar time. And also do tell us to whom the question is addressed to. Uh, we, we have to, uh, a stellar lineup of uh, presenters today, so it really will be helpful, helpful for us to know to whom the question is addressed to. So moving forward, uh, let's have a look at today's agenda. As I said, we have amazing presentations today. So we will kick start with a presentation from Davide, who is going to briefly uh, present us the key highlight from the publication Energy Efficiency Implementation Guidelines. Then we will go on the ground and hear from Mustafa about a case study from Kenya and learn, um, and learn from Kenya. And then we will have a Q&A round where we will then dive deeper and then talk about, um, uh, discuss all the questions that come in, uh, that you have sent out through the, throughout the webinar. So uh, without further ado, um, before I dive into today's uh, webinar and invite my first presenter, I would like to invite Gideon, who is the Technical Advisor for Greening UNHCR Infrastructure for GIZ. And today he's going to quickly set the scene for this webinar and tell us why was the study done and so forth. So Gideon, if you could switch on your camera and your microphone, um, that would be great. Thank you, Ranisha. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome for this interesting webinar. Uh, I'm Gideon Ayla Mikhail, the Technical Advisor for Greening UNHCR Infrastructure in Ethiopia uh, under the ASDS project. Uh, the ASDS project is an abbreviation for energy solutions for displacement settings. It is a part of a global project supporting UNHCR in the implementation of different uh, energy solutions, including greening infrastructures and also energy efficiency. Uh, based, on, based on these uh, highlights or focus areas, uh, we, have, we have tried to conduct different feasibility studies and also energy efficiency studies for UNHCR infrastructures in Ethiopia. Uh, based on that, we have uh, uh, provided different technical recommendations as well as a special energy efficiency guideline, which is going to be presented in today's webinar. By saying this and forwarding my appreciation for Trauma Techno Ambiental for developing this uh, interesting uh, uh, energy efficiency guideline, I invite you to enjoy the webinar and contribute the best you can for uh, energy efficiency. Thank you, and back to you, Ranisha. Thank you so much, Gideon, for setting the scene for today. So if you could switch off your camera, that would be great. Uh, perfect. So um, after that, we have a small poll for today. We want to know, uh, we want to get to know you, the audience, better. So we have one poll question that is going to pop up on your screen now. So um, if you could tell us, if have you implemented energy efficiency solutions before? Yes, no. Um, so um, I will let the poll run for a few minutes, uh, sorry, a few seconds as the votes are coming in. And um, yes, please do take the opportunity to tell us, uh, give us your feedback. So maybe another few more seconds as the votes come in.
and maybe another 10 more seconds because I see a lot of um, votes are like coming in right now. And yeah, I will now uh, close the poll and then display the results. So as you can see, we have a mix. Uh, so I would say 58% of our audience, um, they have not. 42% uh, have already implemented. I hope uh, it will be interesting for both the parties and both the parties go home with lots of lessons learned and also share their own learnings with us today. So for those who have voted yes, I have a second poll question for you. So I'm going to quickly uh, close this one. So if you could tell me, um, so I'm just going to launch it. Um, so for those who have voted yes, if you could also share what kind of e-majors have, um, have you implemented, where they're more related to procurement of energy efficient devices, more on behavioral side, implementation of energy meters, others. So um, in case uh, you have implemented e-majors that were not on the list, Please share in the chat what we're there and we would be we'd love to hear from you. So uh, just tap in the chat what other kind of energy efficiency measures have you implemented. Um, so maybe let's give it another uh, few more seconds as the votes come in. And maybe another few more seconds. And yes, I will now um, stop the poll and showcase the results. So as you can see on the screen, uh, we have a majority who have done procurement of energy efficient devices. And then we have second, um, the chunk is from who have implemented behavior changes. So thank you again for the polls. And I think that set the scene for today's webinar and also to invite my first speaker for today, um, Davide Mazzoni. So um, one second, please. So Davide is a senior project manager and consultant at Tramba Techno Ambienta, who is involved in projects in Africa, Asia and Pacific regions. And today he's going to talk about the um, key insights from the EE guide. So Davide, if you could switch on your camera and your microphone, I will quickly send you a request to share your screen. Thank you, Ranisha. So you should now receive a request to share your screen. Okay, let me know if you can see the presentation full screen mode. Yes, we can and please proceed. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Ranisha. Thank you to Energypedia, uh, UNHCR and GIZ, the SDS team, to co-organize this, uh, this webinar and for inviting me. Uh, hello everyone, uh, in this uh, presentation uh, we will make um, a summary of the, the energy efficiency implementation guidelines that we have developed for, um, for GIZ that is going to be published soon and we will see uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in the specific uh, what is energy efficiency and what does it mean uh, in practical terms for, uh, for uh, humanitarian infrastructure and uh, why is it so important uh, in, this, in this context and, and then we'll go through the five areas of intervention that we identified that are the power generation, power distribution network, the uh, appliances, buildings and behavioral change. So energy efficiency uh, is uh, basically means using less energy to perform the same task uh, and in other words eliminating uh, the energy waste. When we have been, uh, we have been visiting many uh, humanitarian infrastructures, mainly in Ethiopia, and uh, we uh, have uh, asked people, the, the uh, humanitarian actors, what is energy efficiency according to their understanding. And realized, we realized that uh, most of the times they thought about, uh, immediately thought about um, the uh, integration of solar uh, PV or other renewable energy sources. Uh, energy efficiency is basically uh, doing, uh, um, uh, using less uh, electricity, less energy to provide the same services. 
Uh, so uh, with this, uh, some energy uh, savings in, uh, uh, also in monetary terms can be achieved. And therefore, um, uh, here, we here we have the, the benefit of energy efficiency. And uh, uh, looking at the um, energy, uh, looking at the energy efficiency pyramid that uh, is a well-known uh, pyramid that you can uh, see in the, in the slide here, uh, the first um, um, the first uh, uh, foundation for energy efficiency measures is uh, actually uh, the ability to measure and monitor uh, consumption that is a prerequisite for all further interventions because um, we, we cannot uh, improve something that cannot be measured. Uh, and then uh, next, um, uh, energy conservation measures uh, also known as behavioral change shall be implemented because they are uh, low, uh, they have a low investment require, uh, requirements and low complexity. Only after that uh, we can um, jump into uh, energy efficiency actions involving technological change that are more expensive and more complex to implement. And once we um, have um, um, optimize the power system and make it uh, and made it safe uh, we can introduce renewable energy sources such as solar PV in a system that is already uh, pre-optimized and, and can uh, accommodate uh, uh, the uh, introduction of these um, green uh, electricity sources. Uh, why is it so important? Well first of all uh, the cost savings coming from energy efficiency uh, translates into uh, increased resources for people of concern um, and the less dependence on fuel can increase autonomy and the uh, reactivity of uh, the operations uh, on the ground and also of course greening the operations will would make uh, the operations more more sustainable the five areas of interventions that we are uh, we have identified are uh, the power generation distribution appliances buildings and behavioral change and on the power generation side um, we realize that the uh, foundation that, of more of, more, that often is missing uh, is the energy monitoring the energy measurement um, so uh, there are several ways to monitor electricity um, in humanitarian infrastructures the more comprehensive way but also the most expensive and complex system is setting up a, a system based on smart energy meters and uh, but there are also some uh, easier uh, easier ways of, of, of getting a clue of, of, of your uh, energy consumption and uh, I think one of the most underrated uh, systems is basically performing uh, manual readings uh, using the uh, LCD screens that are available from the diesel generators or from the, the, the screens uh, at the uh, main distribution board or at the ATS or the utility grid uh, meter if it is available uh, to uh, record uh, manual readings of the main uh, parameters, uh, main indicators that is the Instantaneous, uh, the instantaneous demand, the daily, monthly, or annual energy readings, uh, but also to check uh, when when uh, the peak load uh, happens during the day, uh, the load profile, and this is very important to uh, calculate the so-called energy performance indicators that are that set the basis to compare uh, two or more sites. Um, uh, to each other, but also to track uh, the uh, improvement uh, in terms of energy efficiency over time. And two, uh, two most famous indicators most used are the electricity consumption per worker, per staff, and the electricity consumption per uh, square meters that, um, that can be used to compare different sites. So uh, humanitarian organizations are encouraged to develop uh, a roadmap for the implementation of energy monitoring uh, and this can be done at different levels so from headquarters to regional down to uh, the field offices uh, and it should be done uh, through uh, a stepped approach so starting from the, um, the simplest way 
of uh, recording electricity consumption to the more comprehensive um, system, uh, the systems that are also more, more expensive. And for example, uh, UNHCR is already implementing um, through the Green Boxes initiatives, um, uh, the installation of uh, IoT energy meters and the jumping into the power generation we know we have seen that uh, avoiding the use of diesel generators is is basically not always possible in uh, in the context of emergency response uh, because of the nature uh, of, of of the operations you need a very uh, versatile and compact and quick uh, uh, power generation systems and, uh, and and also if you think of um, you know, installing solar PV systems, uh, you need generators for uh, backup power. So it, it is important to uh, properly size the, uh, the diesel generators and to use them uh, in an efficient way to avoid uh, waste, of food, uh, waste of fuel that is very expensive in those locations. So one of the um, actions that can be um, easily implemented is instead of using um, diesel generators in shifts uh, but of the same size uh, to use multiple generators of different sizes uh, in shifts so that the smaller generators are working for example at night when the when the load is lower and the and the bigger generators are working during during the day to cover the peak load and this is because generators generators work uh, work best uh, when uh, the load is close to their maximum uh, rated capacity. We don't want generators working uh, below 30% of their rated capacity because they were, uh, wear out very quickly, they consume more fuel, and, and, and generally it's not, it's not ideal. Um, we also recommend to choose the right size of diesel generators on an individual uh, basis uh, versus uh, purchasing them in bulk and then distributing them uh, uh, to the to the field offices, and also uh, we recommend to uh, use single phase generators in small field uh, offices that do not have three phase appliances, because using three phase generators, um, it is much more complicated to distribute the loads across the three phases, and therefore uh, it basically they consume uh, more fuel. Uh, per service provided, uh, and they cannot uh, be used uh, up to the maximum rated capacity. And of course, it is important to improve the local technical capacity, but we will discuss this uh, in detail later. Uh, on the power distribution, the problem of, of uh, energy efficiency is strictly related to the problem of uh, safety, because it, it is true that uh, upgrading, uh, upgrading the distribution networks uh, to, stand, to international standards would uh, um, would uh, create energy savings. You would save electricity, but most importantly, the uh, systems that are installed in, in the current infrastructures many times are not uh, done by qualified uh, electricians and not up to international standards. And, and this is a, a, a big risk for safety. So uh, many sites uh, are under risk of fire because of the undersized cable that are in use. Um, basically, because it, uh, the, uh, the the cables available are only uh, the smallest available sizes available in the market, and lack of suitable protections. Uh, but there is also a high risk of electrocution uh, because of the missing uh, uh, required protections and uh, expo exposures to uh, dangerous like wires and and those uh, circuit breakers hanging. Um, on tensed wires outside the, the distribution boxes. So in the guidelines, we provide a set of uh, recommendations. The most important one is to, uh, to refer to the international standards or to the national wiring rules and, and simply, simply by adopting the recommendations and the, and the steps provided in the wiring rules, you, you can uh, um, ensure that the system complies with uh, with the, the energy efficiency and the safety um, requirements. And also it is important to uh, make sure that the works are performed by a qualified electrician following a technical design. Um, on the appliances side, 
the very first thing to do is to find out, find out what uh, are the main energy consumption drivers, and this can vary uh, side by side. And, and this is important because focusing on the on these low hanging fruits, you can you can uh, um, you can focus on the on the um, on uh, you can focus and and uh, use resources in a more effective way. So we have found, for example, in the sites that we have analyzed that air conditioning accounted for uh, up to 90% of the energy consumption, in, uh, especially in hot uh, climates, and then in some cases water heating, cooking, and water pumping um, also had a relevant, uh, relevant role. And they, so um, based on this, we, de we developed uh, guidelines specifically uh, focusing more on, on, on air conditioners. And the first, uh, the first thing you can do is to um, use international competitive tenders to procure uh, energy efficient, energy efficient uh, equipment um, and set the minimum uh, energy efficiency requirements based on indicators such as the EER and, and avoid uh, buying them on the local market. Um, so also uh, make sure that the equipment have uh, energy efficiency certification such as the Energy Star and Blue Angel labels and, um, and give priority to the ones with uh, refrigerant gases with the lowest uh, possible global, global warming potential. Um, on the design and installation, um, you may want to make sure that the units are sized correctly uh, and there are several tools uh, for sizing, uh, for correctly sizing the, the ACs. One is provided uh, by the MSF. Um, there are several tools, uh, and you would like to uh, make sure that they are sized um, according to the room volume, the wall insulation, the air tightness of the spaces, and the external temperature. It is also important to shorten. Uh, to keep the, the gas pipelines as short as possible and avoid uh, curling them up uh, because this brings uh, in uh, energy inefficiencies and also it's important to keep the external units uh, uh, in a shaded uh, on a shaded wall or to raise them up to the to the gutter level uh, to make sure that the roof will provide some shading and uh, also more most importantly engage uh, qualified designers and installers with proven experience in installing them. On the operation and maintenance, we have seen that uh, the, there is a missing focus on, on, on the maintenance of, of the units. Uh, especially, we recommend to establish a maintenance plan, uh, signing roles and, res and, and responsibilities, and to keep service logs, operation manuals, uh, to replace the pipe insulation um, material uh, when it starts wearing out with solar radiation. Um, this is very, very important. And also, uh, we recommend to perform monthly and annual ordinary maintenance, such as cleaning uh, filters and fins, um, check the pressure of uh, the refrigerant gas, and uh, check for gas leaks. Uh, very easily, you can do it by mixing 50% uh, dish soap with 50% water and, and spray it over the, the pipes and see and look and look for forming bubbles uh, to the tech leak uh, to the tech leaks. And um, also very important to focus on the uh, end of life management of air conditioners because they contain um, very dangerous uh, gases that has that have a global warming potential. Uh, up to uh, two, uh, 2,000 times greater than CO2. And we also provide some guidelines on, on other um, appliances such as efficient cooking. So uh, we recommend to use uh, induction and ceramic uh, plates and to use communal uh, cooking facilities rather than individual uh, cooking facilities uh, at staff uh, quarters. Um, water heating, uh, we present some um, some um, ideas to to reduce also uh, the consumption from uh, water heating and and water pumping as well. And we also talk about uh, energy efficiency uh, on in, in lighting. Um, this is covered um, widely covered in literature and in projects. 
Uh, so we decided to focus on, on, on other areas. Uh, we will also uh, um, encourage the installation, the, the, the installation of fans over the, the air conditioners and, um, and, the, and to use solar uh, direct drive refrigerators, especially in health clinics and for vaccine uh, storage. On um, concerning buildings, we have seen that the main inefficiencies um, are regarding the poor roof insulation, uh, the our tightness of buildings that can definitely be improved, and the insufficient shading, uh, especially in very hot climates, and the poor wall and window uh, insulation. Even uh, in the most recent buildings that are uh, that have uh, been uh, built a few years ago, um, those uh, aspects uh, should be improved. And we try to provide uh, to focus on on low cost and and non cost uh, um, activities and improvements. For example, uh, to improve the art tightness of 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 the of the spaces and um, increase the efficiency of air conditioning. Um, install door sweeps and fine-tune uh, the doors for a perfect closure and especially maintain those things uh, over time. Um, uh, very, sim very simple to plant more trees and increase uh, the number of trees, especially next to the buildings, uh, focusing on fast-growing trees that are uh, locally, uh, that are original of the place that, that you are, uh, where you are planting them. Also, you can uh, paint the walls white to reflect more the sunlight. And, uh, and on the roof insulation and the wall insulation, we have provided some um, low-cost uh, solutions that can be used for the, 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 the installation of future facil facilities or the, um, um, the retrofit of the existing ones. Um, and the behavioral change, we have seen two common bad habits. The first one is leaving doors and windows, uh, keeping them open while the uh, room of the office, the office uh, is air conditioned. And the other one is um, seeing people leaving, uh, staff leaving uh, the air conditioning on uh, in the staff residence when they are out for work. And uh, one reason of this could be a simple oversight, but there are also uh, cultural issues. For example, there might be a belief that the air, the air circulation is necessary to cleanse and, and purify the environment. And also people uh, leave them on 24 seven because uh, the equipment are uh, not very uh, well maintained. And so they are not so effective in, in uh, keeping the, the, the room cool. Um, and we estimated that um, about 60% of uh, energy expenditures can be saved if, if only one of those two common habits uh, would change in, in one of the facilities. Uh, so to tackle this, um, the first thing, uh, as I said before, is setting up, uh, setting up an energy monitoring framework and then to quantify the potential savings for a certain behavioral change by trialing out uh, some of the uh, some of the, uh, the the interventions and compare the energy consumption through the energy monitoring platform uh, with the baseline. So by doing this, you can identify uh, uh, which are the options uh, that are more effective uh, in uh, in reducing the energy consumption. And then you can start implementing them through uh, training, awareness, uh, raising sessions, through the use of emails, informative flyers, and, and, and especially defining targets and trying to motivate people to reach the targets uh, and uh, try to uh, give them recognition for their effort and maybe also rewards. Um, but also keep in mind that removing barriers is necessary. If you do not keep uh, air conditioners uh, well maintained and they strive to keep the offices uh, cool down, people will not change their behavior. So um, yeah, this is a summary of the energy efficiency guidelines. I encourage you to, to read through them and, and provide any feedback. Um, so yeah, 
we'll um, hand it over to you, Ranisha. Thank you so much, David. I'll quickly switch back to my screen then. So thank you. So if you could switch off your camera, that would be great. And um, thank you again for sh uh, giving us a short snaps, a snapshot of the um, of the guideline. And for our audience, we will share the complete guideline with you when it's ready via an email, or it will also be uploaded to the documentation page, the webinar documentation, uh, where you can also find the recording and presentations from today's. So stay tuned and please uh, watch out for those uh, those links. And moving forward, so we heard in David's presentation a lot of different types of um, to-dos or things that we can do on the ground that can result in energy efficiency. So my question to you, the audience, would be, um, do you think the E measures that were shared today, are those applicable in field settings? Um, because we have a wide range of audience today, it would be really interesting to hear from you. So yes, I think it applies. No, I don't. And if uh, you think, no, it doesn't apply, if you could share in the chat why, Maybe it's um, because of some kind of experiences that you have, uh, you have because of based on your own experiences and so on. So we welcome you to also share um, your knowledge with us in the chat about if you don't think it applies, then why? So I was just going to leave it for a few more seconds and um, then I will close the poll and display the results. I will then now close the poll and display the results. So um, we have a majority who said yes, the results they can be applied or they are they can and will be applied on the field. Um, we also have um, six person who say no, they cannot be, and um, three person um, they will share in the chat. So um, I really welcome all those people who said no to also share in the chat. Um, now coming back to our presentation, I will, yes, I will now move back to my screen. And uh, moving forward, as you're typing in the chat and letting me know about your comments, um, I want to move forward and welcome our second presenter for today, Mustafa Al-Momani, who is the energy expert for Greening and Sustainability Team, the UN ATSIA Division of Financial and Administrative, Administrative Management. So Mustafa, great to see you. I will send you a request um, so that you can also share your screen and start your presentation. Thank you, Anish, and uh, hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Um, I'll be sharing my screen just in a second. Okay, very good, I believe. Um, yes. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Anisha. Uh, thank you for joining the webinar. Um, and this presentation, actually, I'll present a case study from one of the NSR operations in, in Kenya. Um, you will find loss of alignment with what David has mentioned. But at the same time, we'll show you some results on the um, outcomes of this kind of, of studies. But before that, let me just introduce you to the Greening and Sustainability team under the Division of Financial and Administrative Management of UNHCR. We have a vision that starts with the people, where the center of our activities is the planet, for sure, and we need always to make sure that the people have proper access to the services they, so they can deliver um, at the highest level. But at the same time, this does not mean that we need to waste the available resources, mainly the energy resources. Also, at the, at the same time, as a protection agency, people are also the center, again, of our activities. So we need to make sure that with all the activities that we consider uh, um, uh, sustainable uh, considerations and greening for the operations, we still make sure that all the services provided to the beneficiaries, to the refugees, are also adequate. Um, the vision, of course, is to reduce the UNCR environmental footprint by using green solutions. And we want it to be and become one of the most sustainable organizations within the UN system. 
as, as you might know, UNHCR is a carbon neutral agency nowadays, but with the expansion of the organization and with the increase uh, of, of our operations in different locations, we need to make sure that the CO2 emissions footprint is also reduced. So our objective is to reduce the emissions by 45% by 2030. And this would be possible by following mainly four major steps. The first one is to measure. And as David mentioned, if you cannot measure it, you will not manage it. And the way we do the measurement is basically by the introduction of the Green Box project, where the Green Box is um, a gadget for energy monitoring, live energy monitoring. And it has been installed in different locations around the world for the UNSR operations. For the East and Horn of Africa and Great Lakes country, 50%, around 50% of the countries are reporting nowadays, and we have live access to all these offices. So we can measure, then of course, we can move to step, to step number two, which is management and reduction. For the purpose of this goal, we will only cover the measurement, the management and the reduction, but also our team works on the creation of business case studies, which allow us, of course, to shift and transition the USR operations from diesel generators and dirty grids, I would say, to cleaner solutions, mainly solar energy. And of course, as soon as these business cases are promising, we move to the implementation stage. Um, the greening, greening the blue report um, uh, indicated the status of UNCR and other UN agencies. I invite you to go to greeningtheblue.com. Uh, you will find it in the chat box during this call to have more details about what UNSR is doing in the greening and sustainability area, also other sister agencies in the UN. But today, you, UNSR is a high carbon footprint agency, which is unfortunate. But at the same time, of course, we are doing some steps, solid steps, I would, I would say concrete steps, to mitigate all the environmental impact. But as of today, we still high carbon footprint agency with low implementation of green activities, at least for the ones that has already been implemented. Our position today is here. And of course, we don't want to see ourselves as one of the um, uh, organizations that emit the most amount of CO2 emissions. Um, actually, we want to optimize our global infrastructures also to become a leader and the green transition era. For the UNSR framework for climate action, mainly we have three pillars. We start with the law and policy under pillar two, pillar under pillar one. Pillar two is the operations, of course, I mean, climate mitigation uh, for the operations activity, where pillar number three focuses on the environmental footprint. And this is what our team is doing for the greening and sustainability activities. And as you can see here, the sources of CO2 footprint comes mainly from the infrastructure, the NCR offices, the accommodations, uh, um, and the use, of course, of the diesel generators in fragile and rural areas, where 16% is being uh, um, produced by air travel and 23% by fleet and other travel. The total emissions as of today is around 97,000 tons of CO2 equivalent per year, and per capita is 5.0 ton of CO2 equivalent per person. These are big numbers, and of course, we had to take an action today and, and now. For the average water consumption, it's 16 cubic meter per person, and the waste generated 250 kg per person. More details, as I mentioned, can be found in the greening that we report for the two years, 2020 and 2021. Jumping into the case study, and um, a big thanks to, of course, our uh, partner, GIZ, for supporting all the activities that uh, we carried out in Kenya um, and other countries in the region. And this study actually was implemented by Energy Intelligence Africa, one of the consultants that we collaborated with um, during this, um, uh, these activities. Um, but of course, if we want to do an, I mean, an energy audit and energy efficiency, we have to know why we're doing it and highlight the targets, the objectives. 
But first, we needed to start with defining sustainability. And I, I invite everyone to tell us their opinion about sustainability or their definition of uh, sustainability in the chat box. But mainly, and this is my opinion, that sustainability is a very flexible term. It could mean for some creations, zero net carbon, where you, I mean, your organization needs to minimize or even to zero the carbon emissions. Other agencies, other offices would consider achieving nearly zero emissions as a sustainability uh, uh, I mean, factor. Also, climate positive office agency um, um, would be also another definition. definition. All these definitions or this interpretation is based on specific reasons and specific criteria. It could be the geographical location, the available resources, the available infrastructure. So if you are completely off the national grid, one of the sustainability definitions for you would be going off the national grid by utilizing um, 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 renewable energy solutions. Or if you, if you are connected to the national grid, the national grid is green, and you are using sustainable equipment and devices, then you could go climate positive, meaning you just plant more trees and you contribute to the environment. So defining sustainability is a very important step before any energy efficiency and audit activities. But also we need to understand what kind of or types and cost of energy that's being used in these facilities. Well, in this study, we will focus mainly on the electricity as one of the, uh, of course, shapes and sources of, of energy or shapes of energy, forms of energy. Um, also to understand how the energy is being used and possibly wasted. Um, of course, we know how we use the energy, but we need to identify exactly where we use it and when do we use this energy and if there is some waste and using this energy. Just to give a quick example, if you have a brand new water pump that's very efficient, beautiful, but it's connected to um, an old water network system, then some leakages would be here and there, meaning the water pressure in the piping system will be minimized meaning you will need the water pump to work more frequently to keep the pressure on the same level. So this is not only waste of water, but also waste of energy. So this also needs to be identified. Um, also the identification and analysis of alternatives that have the potential to achieve energy savings. Um, it could be quick wins, it could be behavioral changes, it could be install, installing new equipments, new investments in, uh, in different equipments, more energy efficient, and of course, cost effective solutions. Also for the load management, it's important to understand how our loads before any energy conservation measures look like. And this is how basically the loads are, but if you, consider conservation measures and you implement all these measures, then there is a certain reduction in your consumption, although the behavior or not the behavior, but the shape of your consumption is, is the same. But if you introduce um, other solutions like battery systems, solar energy, then you would achieve some peak shaving or load shifting. Um, um, where are the load shifting? Of course, you will, um, uh, remain at the same level or the total consumption would remain the same. What's the methodology that was followed for the considered office? It's investment grade energy audit and it was not only zero and, and low cost but of course uh, uh, the investment grade um, um, is the methodology that was followed. Um, so what are the main steps let's say the preliminary data collection mainly for the historical historical energy consumption data, uh, the building envelope, the occupancy level, and also the type of equipment, their health status, their operational hours, and so on. Then we needed to carry out a detailed energy consumption or data logging. And here you can see one of the data loggers that was used by the consultant to capture the instant power and also with smaller steps for 
um, uh, the uh, energy consumption. So we would have better access and understanding to the way we use energy and what's the differences between the weekends and the weekdays, um, what the difference between a Monday and, and a, a Tuesday and Wednesday, and what are the justifications behind any kind of changes or differences. And then we have, of course, the uh, identification of energy conservation measures on the areas that uh, was mentioned by David, but for this, uh, I mean, for this part of the presentation, we'll focus on only the devices and um, um, equipment. Then, of course, the financial and environmental analysis. Um, as you can see here, the saving measures that were considered are multiple, but the four main areas are first lighting system and lighting improvement. Then best of practices in air conditioning system, best of practices in plug-in loads and energy management and real-time monitoring. Of course, behavioral change is also one of the uh, areas. Um, it's not mentioned here, but it's a, a starting point for any energy efficiency uh, measure. Um, let's start with, or before we start with the lighting system, as you can see here, for the facility that we considered, the load consumption is distributed in, I mean, in an interesting way for the plug-in loads like TVs, PCs, laptops, charging stations, etc., it was around 60%. The lighting component, 30%. ICT, 2%. IC uh, air conditioning system, 34%. And motors and pumps, 2%. Um, of course, there is lots of opportunities there, but we will discuss first the lighting um, uh, opportunities or lighting improvement. And as you can see here, the lighting um, consumption represents 3% of the overall electricity uh, consumption of this facility. And let me just zoom in here for a quick comparison between fluorescent and LED lighting units, you know, the conventional fluorescent and the LED lights. We start with, for instance, the temperature in order, let's say, to appreciate these differences and why we keep saying LED lights are um, recommended as a starting point for energy conservation. Um, for instance, the, the temperature for the fluorescent lights, they reach 55 Celsius degree, where the LEDs would be around 35 Celsius degree. Why this is important, I would refer to what we learned back to school, and I believe everyone heard of this law of conservation of energy that says energy can neither be created nor destroyed, only converted from one form of energy to another. Meaning, if you are sitting in your office and you're using a fluorescent lighting unit, that means the heating or the heat that comes from this unit is larger than a unit from LED. Let's assume you are using, sorry, I'm not going to feel comfortable, but let's assume you're using um, 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 an AC unit, then the energy or the uh, the AC unit will keep working in order to maintain the same level of temperature that, uh, uh, I mean, you consider like 23 degrees or 24 degrees. It might feel minimal, but you can imagine if it's a bigger room and with multiple fluorescent lights and bigger ACs that are not even energy efficient. That means that these ACs will keep using power for no reason only to mitigate the heat that was produced by the fluorescent lights. Then the lifespan for the fluorescent is 8,000 hours and 45, comparison to 45,000 hours for the LEDs. The yearly cost also is almost a double. Um, the um, uh, lumens per watt, it's almost a double, could be a triple. And then the light bulbs use over a lifetime using when uh, I mean, if you, if you, uh, uh, I mean, for the lifetime of your, let's say, your house, you would use um, three lighting units of a fluorescent to replace, I mean, for the same period, you would use LED lighting unit. So what are the quick ones in this area? First, and always behavioral change and also optimizing the operation hours. By, the, by this, we mean when you leave your office, just close, I mean, turn off the light, and this would be more than enough as a starting point. Well, the current situation for the facility we're talking about, 88% of the lighting units is conventional, of course, fluorescent lights here, and the total number of units is 1,300 lighting fixtures. Um, what are the options? We can do bulk relamping, group relamping, 
replace all the uh, uh, fluorescent units all together and uh, uh, utilize the LED lights. Also enhance and maintain system performance by making sure that if this fluorescent or even LED lighting unit does not deliver the desired light, you just change it because it will be using the same amount of power for less lumens. Then we have LED lamps replacements, and this is what we will show just here. As you can see here, in the facility we discussed, there is a good number of fluorescent lights. If we take a look, for instance, at, at, at this one, single two feet fluorescent tube, the total wattage is 28 watt, where the replacement, if you want to use LED, it would be only nine watts. So you would be saving nine watts or 67% of energy by replacing this lighting unit. Another example, let's say that when four feet fluorescent tube T8, same 46 could be replaced by with uh, um, 18 watt LED unit and the saving percentage will be around 61%. Um, by working on the lighting units alone, you will achieve 50, I mean, we will achieve 56% reduction uh, um, 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 from 43, kilowatt to 19 kilowatt. This is a big number. And if you remember, I mentioned the previous slide, the overall consumption of fluorescent lights or the lighting in general is 3% of the total consumption of the facility, meaning we are achieving 1.5% uh, uh, energy saving of, of course of the total consumption. And then from financial perspective, the break even point would be only within seven to eight months. If you invest $1,000, then this $1,000 will be reduced from, of course, the energy, uh, it does not matter if it's diesel generators or a national grid, but within seven months, you will break even and you will start even saving on the longer term as long as this lighting unit is working. Then we talk about the, uh, the best of practices and air conditioning. And in Kenya, they always have this brochure that says the more stars, the more energy efficient. So make sure whenever you purchase a new unit for the office, if you're a supply officer, if you're a technical officer uh, or uh, um, with, with different expertise, while you have a decision when it comes to utilizing energy equipment, choose the equipment with the more stars. The quick ones in this area, as David mentioned, close the doors and windows whenever the AC is on. We don't need that heat, I mean, exchange to be negative. We don't want to leave to lose the cool energy because we kept the uh, the door open or the window open. And of course, setting the AC temperature at 24, 23 would be fine. Um, but of course, this will achieve a, a good result. And if your AC is not, uh, uh, I mean, cooling properly at a 23 and 24, that does not mean that 23 is not cool enough, but it means your AC unit needs some maintenance. For the current situation and the office, the ACs represent 30% of the overall electricity consumption. What are the options for, uh, um, as, as solutions? First, ensure good maintenance practices. F23 is not fine with you. It's not the AC again, it's, it's not, sorry, it's not the temperature level, it's the AC that requires some maintenance. Also proper air conditioners sizing. It, it does not require lots of capacities, just make sure you follow the standards. There is an ASHRAE uh, table that tells you if your room size as this, then this is the proper uh, size uh, for uh, the, the AC. And if, if it's well shaded, then increase it or decrease the size by 10%. If it's under direct sun, then increase it by 10%. So the regulations are out there, easy to use, and it does not require specific capacities. Then, of course, the utilization of energy efficient variable refrigerant flow technology. Here for the energy efficiency of the ACs, these are the initial results that will be implemented. First, the estimated energy savings by following these best practices is 15%. And don't forget that 34% of the overall consumption come from ACs. You do the math, this is the overall consumption for the facility. And uh, if you know, I mean, the rate or the tariff for, uh, for the region, then of course you can understand how high the 15% saving is financial wise. 
And then from environmental perspective, you're also saving a lot of CO2 emissions. For the break even uh, point, it is a promising. It's not as good as, of course, lighting units, but it's two years. So within two years, you will uh, achieve the payback. Uh, I mean, the payback period is two years, and then you will achieve some savings. Um, and in general, if we consider all the best practices and all the energy efficiency measures that's recommended by this study, including the lighting improvement and the best practices in AC management, the best practices in plug load management and the development of structured energy management program, then the facility is achieving 13, around 14% energy saving. This is a significant number. I'll take you back one quick time to the total consumption. You, you do the math again and you will appreciate the added value of the energy efficiency and applying these measures. Um, on behavioral change, a quick thought here. Um, we are humans. We tend to forget. If you are uh, an admin officer, if you are the energy environment officer, so make sure you keep sending reminders to our colleagues in the offices and the field to turn their lights off when not in use, or to keep all windows and doors properly closed when the ACs are, uh, uh, are running. Also, switch them off when with for ACs and for lighting units when you leave the office. Make sure that you send these reminders from time to another, with time, it gets to become habit. And if the, uh, uh, I mean, we're different people, so different languages, uh, someone would appreciate the environmental language. And uh, if you tell them that operating your two tons AC for one business day would produce around, I mean, from, from five to eight kgs of CO2 emissions, then they will stop uh, or minimize the operation hours or make sure the doors are closed, the windows are closed. If the person understands the financial argument, then tell them that uh, one AC unit for one hour will, will consume three, or I mean one to three uh, electricity unit. And of course, you will uh, you will know the amount or the tariff for your office. So the financial savings are also important. If technical argument, then you will find a way. But different people, again, different languages, and we need to make sure that we speak the right language to the right person. The Best Practices Guide for UNSCR. We've developed this document and it was shared with our colleagues and uh, uh, around the world. Um, if you are a UNSCR officer and you don't have access to this document, please reach out to us and we'll make sure to share it with you. Mainly, it focuses on energy, waste, and water. I believe this is everything from my side. Back to you, Anisha. Thank you so much, Mustafa. I'm going to quickly share back to my screen. So again, thank you. That was such an excellent packed presentations from you and Davide. And I think both the presentation had so many lessons learned and things that we could learn and take home with us. And that brings us to the Q&A round. And we do have a lot of questions pouring in in the question box. Uh, if you haven't sent us your question, please use this opportunity to send us your question. And um, Davide and Mustafa, if you could switch on your camera, we could uh, proceed with the Q&A round then. Perfect. And again, audience, please send us your questions. We have an amazing panel today and we are learning a lot. So uh, we have a lot of questions, but maybe I'll divide them in two sections. One is more on the thematic level and one is directly related to each of your presentation, different slides. So let's start with the one that is related to the slides um, so that we get that uh, and then we come back to the more thematic questions. So this one is for you, Davide. Um, you had one slide where we talked about a shading as one of the energy efficiency measures for AC. So the question is, how much energy can be saved if there is a like a number of percentages that you can give from experience? Very good question. Um, so during our study, uh, we realized that some of the um, energy efficiency measures that we proposed uh, are not easily, um, uh, it is not very easy to, to quantify the, um, the energy saving uh, impact. We are sure um, that uh, this will bring consistent um, impact, but we are not able to quantify it. Uh, in order to quantify it, 
uh, one of the first things that we recommend is to set up uh, an energy monitoring system so that uh, by trialing out this uh, at one side, you can really um, you can really uh, get a sense, uh, get a perception of uh, how much you can save it, and then possibly you can replicate it in in, in other sites. Uh, what I can say is that uh, being physically on site, I really felt the difference between two sites in Ethiopia. One was completely immersed in, in to a dense vegetation because the site was quite uh, was quite old and and trees were were planted and another site was uh, there were there were not a, a lot of trees and the trees planted were not close to close to the buildings uh, and you can really feel the the difference in terms of um, uh, how uh, long you need to turn on the the air conditioning on to cool down the the uh, the rooms and the offices, but also walking in the compound, you can really feel the difference within the uh, the, the same climatic area. So yeah, I hope that uh, answers the question. Yes, it does. Thank you so much. And I think we also already saw from Mustafa's presentation when he showed, when we actually look at how much is the energy consumption, we do see, for example, in his presentation, he already said 34% was coming from ACs. So if you could have savings in those 34%, that's already a big amount. Um, thank you so much. And that's my cue to move to you, Mustafa. So we had also some questions directly related to the slides. In one of the slides, earlier slides, you talked about uh, the CO2 emissions from um, UNHCR's activities. We had this um, amazing like, uh, um, bar diagram. And the question is the emissions, the total emissions that you showed, do they all also consider UNHCR supply chain and refugee camps? Those are two separate, but um, if you could answer those. Um, well, I believe they do capture the operations of uh, the, the sorry the infrastructure, the travel, and the um, um, I mean air travel and fleet travel mainly. Um, and this is the 70, uh, 97,000 uh, tons of CO2 emissions. Um, as maybe as I mentioned in the first uh, slides, um, we are um, I mean our work, our climate mitigations activities are distributed into three uh, levels. The first one is Federal number one, which is uh, policy and regulations, and then operations, which is, which addresses your question on the uh, humanitarian activities in the field, the hospitals, the um, and the of course the schools or any other support facilities, and then there is the units are humanitarian infrastructure, the admin facilities mainly, where the numbers that we shared are coming from there. Thank you so much. And also I have another follow-up question is, so you talked about the different energy efficiency measures and the question is how do this energy efficiency major improve UNHCR operational activities? Well, let me turn around, I mean, turn this, this question around by the, the target of energy efficiency, as I remember David mentioned at the beginning of his presentation, is to maintain the same level of equality of service and of course of uh, well-being and livelihood of the targeted facility and personnel. Um, so energy efficiency does not mean that we want you to switch off your AC when it's uh, 40 and 45 degrees uh, to save some energy. No, we don't want you to do that, especially for um, an urgency and a protection agency like UNCR. We need to make sure that staff members are comfortable when they work. Um, but instead of opening your door or uh, keeping the windows open when the AC is, uh, is operating, just, I mean, close it and we take, I mean, the management and the technical team would take care of the rest by replacing the AC units and make sure you, you receive energy efficient unit. Um, so the surface is the same and hopefully even, even better with time, especially with the decentralized solutions if we introduce uh, renewable energy systems to mitigate or to minimize the um, let's say the uh, of hours of the such generators. Um, yeah, this is this is my my answer to your question. Thank you so much. And I have one final question to the along the same line is, you talked about um, diesel generators being part of also the energy supply for UNHCR, but also about solar uh, solar systems. Is there like a percentage breakdown that you can give like how much is the renewable and how much is the diesel as of now? 
I don't think I have this number available. Uh, I can confirm to you that most of the rural operations rely the most on diesel generators. For some countries, we're lucky that these countries have uh, widely spread it or 100% electrification, uh, even in rural areas. In this case, also units operations are connected to the national grid. And for some countries like Uganda, for instance, Uganda is one of the greenest grids. And uh, for some of the refugee camps and settlements, uh, um, offices for NSR, they are connected to the national grid that's already agreed. And from that perspective, there is not much to do in terms of transitioning from conventional to green energy. So different scenarios, different countries, unique solutions and unique requirements. Um, but of course, we need to achieve our target, our objective by reducing the CO2 emissions by 45%. Thank you so much. Um, and now maybe I go to back to the overall theme. So uh, in both of your presentations, you highlighted different energy efficiency measures, showed how they benefited in terms of cost saving and so on. But uh, my question to both of you would be, from your experience, we see that there are so much benefit, but what is the main obstacles or challenges that is still hindering the adoption of E measures? So if you could also talk about a little bit challenges that you saw when you were trying to make that switch or from your experiences. So Davide, if you'd like to go first on that. Yes, Ranisha. So I believe um, one of the main barriers is really um, the, the lack of awareness among staff and officers um, about the potential impact of, of their uh, actions or uh, for the technicians, the potential impact of running uh, the air conditioners, the generators and the solar systems efficiently. So uh, this can be solved by uh, the establishment of uh, a, the energy management system and, and allowing people to to, to clearly see, to remind them through emails, printing them on flyers, what is the what is the um, the uh, the daily load profile of their compound? What is the, the, the when uh, when the peak load happens? And because I found that people are really motivated and really want to to give a contribution, um, uh, even if they are completely busy on their operations, they are willing to to help. Generally speaking, but they do not have a clue on what to do and what uh, kind of impact that, that, uh, that could have. And also, I think another point is the, let's say, the emergency response mindset that is um, very uh, typical of, of uh, humanitarian um, operations because uh, the operations need to be quick, need to be flexible and need to happen now and maybe a refugee camp in seven years, eight years uh, it will not exist anymore. So when we think about energy efficiency, we need to switch a little bit more towards uh, long-term uh, planning, planning and extending also the, the time horizon for financial analysis uh, and evaluation of, of benefits uh, of implementing these, these, these initiatives. And also, uh, many times decisions are based on a few, uh, purely on the on the capex evaluations so on, on the investments required. Um, also, because of how uh, the the funding uh, are um, are streamlined through the through the organizations, uh, while uh, are more focus on the operational expenditures and the potential savings from. Um, you know, um, replacement costs uh, for diesel generators or air conditioners or whatever, and running costs uh, might help a little bit to to take better decisions. And and maybe another barrier could be the big difference, the big distance that uh, exists between the field offices that feel a little bit um, isolated and and the and the, instead the, the, the country offices and the headquarters, uh, not because the country offices uh, do not do uh, enough, but just because the uh, field offices are really isolated because they are in rural settings and many times they don't have the capacity, they don't have the resources, they don't have budget to, to implement those things and they don't have time. So in this case, I think that uh, top-down approach uh, carried out centrally uh, could be a solution to explore. 
Thank you so much, Devide. So basically making it as easy as possible so that when someone asks, what can I do? Here is the list. This is what you can do as easy as it can get. Um, thank you so much. Mustafa, would you like to add something to that? Well, actually, it's, it's interesting also to hear the feedback from Devide and I take notes of that. So in, in the future activities, we also keep all these obstacles in mind to mitigate them and make sure we at least find a way around this. So thank you, Devide, for, for this answer. Um, I, I would mention only one here. Uh, there are many obstacles for sure, but one of them would be um, the appreciation of the small steps and a huge impact. And this is what's beautiful about energy, energy efficiency. You just switch off the line and you switch off the AC when you're not in the office and you will achieve major savings. So this is one of the things that we need to, to, to stress more on, which is uh, um, just do what you can. You don't need to do the investment immediately. If you just, uh, if you're willing to switch up the light and, and everyone is, then just switch up the light and the AC when you don't need them. Uh, but of course, um, um, this means uh, um, um, the energy efficiency spectrum or solution spectrum is, is fine. And uh, we take it step by step. We don't need to go to the investment uh, I mean, from day when. No, this, this is to start with the behavior change and the lighting, the the management system, the energy management system, and the um, uh, ACs or other heavy or hungry uh, units uh, replacement. Um, um, long answer short, I would say, just take it easy, take it step by step, do whatever we can, and this is our today. This is one way to overcome this kind of obstacles. Thank you so much, Mustafa. And I think I'll also quote on what David presented in one of his slides that make it automatic, having this automatic door closer, making as many activities automatic that people don't have to think, ask questions. That's always helpful too. Um, now, my next question to you is, I think in um, Mustafa's presentation, you already showed some of the areas where you improved the EE, but overall, from both of your experiences, what are the easily avoidable, avoidable mistakes that you see that you keep on seeing as you go on different field visits or your study, and you're like, that's a mistake we can totally correct. So um, the, I know, Mustafa, you're smiling, so maybe I'll pass it to you. Yeah, actually, it's, it's it's very funny sometimes. And um, I was in the field just a few days ago, and easily noticeable that um, the lights are on in the afternoon time in the beautiful Africa, the shiny Africa, where you didn't need light at this time. And it's not even in the office; it's just like in the corridor. So I'm easily to spot this kind of, um, um, to say challenges and areas where we can improve and it's not only applicable for the humanitarian agency of course it's everywhere i mean sometimes we see it in our own houses and our own um, i mean the facilities that we visit on a frequent basis um so this is an easy to spot um i mean area of improvement same for the ac sometimes you enter an office or um i mean you visit a friend or let's let's make it i mean open and wide here um you will find them Operating the AC on a certain, they say, 17 to 18 Celsius degree, which is not convenient. It's very cold. And if they go to 23, 24, then this is optimum. And this is a good temperature for the body and for the, 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 the atmosphere. Um, but also, you save energy. Also, we see it. Everyone sees this kind I mean, of, uh, of, of, uh, of challenges. Opening the door, opening the window. They just close them. As simple as that. Thank you so much. And over to you, Davide. Thanks, Ranisha. Um, yeah, there are many, um, many things that can be done. One thing that um, I would recommend as a first op, uh, the first action is safety. So energy, energy efficiency is very related to safety. We often see um, compounds where um, the electrical system would not uh, simply will burn out if you connect a power plant to it or if you connect the compound to the grid. Uh, so many people think that just by getting a transformer, getting connected to the grid, or getting a solar hybrid system, they will solve their they will solve their uh, electricity generation issues. But uh, getting more power into the weak distribution networks is actually very dangerous. And apart from the energy wasted. Uh, that you that that you get. Um, it happened to me in Ethiopia that 
uh, the in one of the compounds the the generation was good but the um, the furthest loads the, the the people that were living in the opposite uh, side of the compound the voltage drop was so high that they could not uh, that the voltage was not enough to run even the the refrigerators so uh, these those are critical situations and uh, so this should be fixed first and then we can talk about energy efficiency but this is the critical point of many situations and then there should be more focus i think on on establishing procedures for the operation and maintenance of air conditioners on on lighting on running the generator solar systems uh, water pumps so th there should to be compulsory uh, procedures to follow based on, in case of the equipment or the appliances, based on the installation manuals. Many times installation manuals are not available on site, so you don't know how to, uh, how to maintain, how to maintain the, the assets. Um, and also, yeah, uh, you can promote behavioral change, but then if the ACs are not maintained well, uh, you can tell people, yeah, set the temperature uh, at uh, 24 degrees, but they, uh, the, the, the temperature would not drop below 30 degrees because the, the, the air conditioner is not able to, to cool them, uh, the, the room temperature down. And then I will suggest to, first of all, uh, have a look at our uh, guidelines when they are published. There are many suggestions and there are resources from, uh, from the MSF, from ICRC. There are very good resources um, online available. Thank you so much to both of you from, for raising all of those issues. I think we talked a lot about why it's important, where we can improve, but I think for all the humanitarian organizations that are on call today, the most important is what do we do about it? How do we go about it as an organization? Um, so maybe my question to you is if you have any recommendation to any of the organizations who are listening to, your, to us today and now they are convinced that they need to implement energy efficiency, how could they go about it? What would uh, the implementation process look like in real life for them? So uh, if you could just lay down some of the recommendation or process step that you might have as suggestions. Um, so Davide, if you want to go first on that. Okay, yeah, this is a key point because uh, we have been talking about very nice things, but uh, how do we implement them? So uh, I uh, say again, uh, the very for the very first uh, thing to do is establishing an energy monitoring system, and then you can take different uh, approaches. One is more um, focused on, on strengthening the internal capacity of the organization and trying to build uh, the uh, so-called um, energy management system. So there are um, international standards, norms, for example, the ISO uh, 50,001 um, 50, that provides, that are practical, guide, uh, uh, practical guidelines to introduce an energy management system. For example, an energy management system always starts with a clear energy policy. I'm an organization, I show the willingness to invest and to uh, to show them, my staff to my uh, representatives that I want to invest in energy efficiency. Why, I explain why this is important to us. And then the following step in in this, uh, for example, in this um, um, international standard, but there are other standards as well, uh, is to appoint an energy manager. And the energy manager will, will have certain responsibilities. Will appoint. Uh, um, the technicians to do a, to follow a certain procedures will develop certain procedures will make sure that uh, manuals will be available and so on and so forth. So um, the resources um, are uh, available. Uh, the international standards are uh, practical guidelines to implement the, st the things that we have been discussing today. It's only a matter to uh, have the, the 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 willingness to do it. And and, um, and and start doing it. Um, so this this is enough one of the approaches. So strengthening the the internal capacity that will translate ultimately to strengthening the local technical capacity in in the in the field. Um, the second uh, approach is is more like uh, outsourcing the services to. Uh, in Europe, we have the uh, the ESCO models, the energy service companies that um, basically uh, take care of, of, uh, of the entire implementation 
of energy efficiency and energy supply in a more holistic way and uh, they do get some remuneration from the energy savings so um, if they achieve to, to make you save more money they, they will get more compensation uh, so part of the compensation scheme is based on that um, in uh, eastern africa we are seeing now that some there is some movement there are some uh escorts that are um, that are merging um and uh, this could be a potential um, implementation model for for the for the next few years depending on how the market will 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 develop thank you so much and over to you mustafa um i would totally agree with what david has said and there is not much to add there uh, but of course measurement is the most important point we need to measure and understand our uh, energy consumption in order to take an action without measurement i mean the action would not be uh, the decision would not be an informed decision this is a good starting point if the capacity is not available within the organization then escos are available out there you can just outsource them and um, receive this adequate service from the available experts um, also, we have, I mean, as, as I said uh, before, um, as a starting point, do whatever you can and take it step by step. If today you can do the behavior change, then it's a start with that. If you are aware of the saving opportunities in the lead or the lighting areas, then it starts also, start also with that. If the energy management system, which is true, it takes more time to implement, and the ACs replacement or even the ACs assessment takes more time, then schedule all, the, all, all these um, activities within a specific timeline. And by the time you build the capacities and you outsource the required uh, ESCO company, then of course you would have already achieved the measurement uh, requirement, also all the quick wins, the behavior change, the retrofitting of the lighting, as already in a place. Um, so these are one, one of the I mean, approaches, of course, which, which might be suitable for some organizations. Um, and then let's not forget that sustainable procurement is a very important area to, to consider. Um, you can starting today as a procurement uh, officer or as an energy and environment officer to um, indicate that whenever you need to procure um, uh, metal sheets for say for housing solutions or the AC unit make sure it's a sustainable solution or an energy efficient equipment I think these are good starting points until the capacity is available to take uh, broader actions thank you so much and on the sustainability procurement we also saw in David's presentation and also Mustafa they also give us insight into some of the um, low sorry um, uh, energy efficient uh, logos that you can look at the more the stars the better so these are the things we can always keep in mind um maybe i go back to you debbie day so in your presentation we talked about e um so energy efficiency improvement across five spectrums so we looked at power generation we looked at uh, power distribution we looked at appliances which we talked a lot then we looked at buildings and we also talked about behavior change a lot um, from your experience, and um, this can only Mustafa, you can also jump in. Where do you see the most need for awareness raising? Because that was also one of the challenges that we identified in the beginning. And since we have these five concrete areas where we could do a lot, where do you see the least amount of awareness raising, awareness raising being done currently, and needs more to be done? Well, uh, difficult question, but uh, definitely. Um, uh, say again that for me the um it is very important that the the power distribution system is well maintained and uh so that whatever um measure you implement whatever action you implement on the generation side the 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 compound the assets can 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 hold it can 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 receive it and behavioral change we have discussed a lot about it uh i think uh come to say again that uh, behavioral change uh, actions would work only if proper maintenance of the, the systems is, is guaranteed. So you can also 
um, focus a lot on, on procurement of, of energy efficient appliances and this is really 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 important because it can it can be done uh, centrally from the procurement officers from whoever uh, uh, at headquarters or, or uh, at the central level but uh, then if you buy efficient appliances let's say you buy an, a very efficient um, air conditioner you don't maintain it you don't maintain it uh, it starts uh, wearing out after six months because it's under the the, the direct uh, um, radiation of the sun and you, co you, you you after six months you have lost the the the, the efficiency improvement compared to uh, what you had uh, you would have gained with a, with an old model and a not efficient model and only in six months of being exposed to the to the to the radiation so yeah, this is one of the areas where I think um, uh, we need more awareness raising, but uh, it depends from yeah, it depends on on the type of organization, of course, and the size and, and everything. Thank you so much, uh, Mustafa. Would you like to add anything to that? Well, um, no, actually, uh, maybe one one small thing that we need to make sure the change comes from all levels. It starts with, I mean, the management sometimes, but also sometimes, I mean, the initiative is being considered by the, the staffs and the colleagues in the field without managerial authorities. Um, so this is very important. Um, and we do, um, based on our capacities, we deliver change based on our capacities. Um, other than this, I totally agree with what David mentioned. Thank you so much. And maybe let me quickly summarize because we saw we got so much nice points. So for our audience, so let's not forget about the ONM. Uh, we talked a lot about behavior appliance, which is of course very important. But same time, let's also um, think that we might have an energy efficient appliance, but we need to maintain it. And there you can look out uh, for the guidelines, which also has a lot of uh, practical measures uh, for O&M of different appliances. Um, sustainable procurement, very, very important. It has to start from there. Look for energy efficient appliances when you are trying to, uh, when you are starting the procurement. And then third, the very important point would be it cannot. It has to be the whole organization. Um, we can start from one thing, but to make it, uh, it has to spread to the whole organization to make it sustainable. Uh, so thank you so much. As I look towards the time, I know we are coming to us the end. So um, maybe uh, we go our last round where each one of you could maybe, uh, let's do this. If you uh, could give one piece of advice or one takeaways that you want the audience to take home with them. And with that, we then, how about we close the webinar with the last piece of advice um, that you'd like the audience to take home with them. Uh, so Davide, would you like to go first on that? Uh, my first advice would be to read our guidelines <laughs> when they will be published <laughs> and all the um, all the material that is available online. Um, the MSF and ICRC and other organizations have published a lot on this and um, and uh, yeah talk about energy efficiency within your organization and because this is the starting point to get people uh, motivated and taking it as, um, as a game, basically as a challenge, as uh, one of the other challenges that we are uh, facing. Um, so yeah, basically that. Thank you so much. Over to you, Mustafa. Um, from my side, uh, I'd like to give practical uh, examples. And yesterday I had a meeting with my manager and she said, switching off your video during uh, a video call would save 90 percent of uh, or will would it use the carbon emissions by 90 percent and as i'm speaking i'm looking at a website called euronews.com and the headline is turning off your camera in video calls could cut carbon emissions by 96 percent and any other activity that does not seem as big as it uh, i mean as big as it i mean really is um um, um, I mean, um, um, this, um, again, small steps, big, big impact. So let's always keep this in mind on all levels. If you are in the field, make sure you take energy efficient uh, steps. If you're a manager, if you are uh, a senior, um, also decision maker, then also make sure that you take the right actions for the benefit of our, uh, I mean, planet. I mean, 
we have to act today and now, and we don't have much time to mitigate the impact of climate change. Thank you so much. And I'll keep that in mind for my next video call. And with that, thank you to all our lovely speakers for an amazing presentation. And thank you to our audience for staying with us for one and a half hours. I hope you enjoyed the webinar and had uh, also learned a lot. We know today was a start of a discussion and we know energy efficiency is much, much dense than what we could cover in one and a half hours. We are aware of that. So that's why we want you to invite you to engage more in this dialogue. So if you want to know more or engage more or are also interested in um, technical advisory or ad, um, uh, any just want to get involved more in this topic um, reach out to us um, you can send us an email at info at energypeter.info we'll forward it to uh, GIZ or you can also send us um, in the chat uh, what uh, anything you want to say to us your feedbacks um, once you close this webinar our feedback form will also appear so please do take that and tell us how you liked the today's webinar all the resources that we talked about the greening the blue report the energy efficiency guidelines the webinar uh, video and presentations so everything will be online on the documentation page which will be shared to you via an email today and it's also currently available in the chat so check that one out and um, with that a huge thank you to all of you one more time i wish you a good afternoon and i hope to see you in the next webinar thank you and bye bye Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye.